Thank you to the Patreon members for supporting the channel. Far, far down river was a plateau. On that plateau was a spring, which fed a small stream, which trickled off the terrace in a gentle waterfall. And it was here on this plateau that the family of Iron Teeth decided to settle. There was bad water in the region, pouring out of underground sources and mixing with the river water below. But the terrace where the beavers were was protected, which is why they had picked it to be their new home. Here they would be safe from the bad water and able to build themselves a new settlement. The family was smaller than before. It had been a long journey. Some of the beavers had died, others had set off on their own, but the beaver Razi was committed to leading the family he had left. So the beavers got to work, chopping down trees for logs, gathering berries for food, and building water pumps along the stream. And the Iron Teeth wanted to get an early jump on science, something they struggled with last time. And their family was bigger than last time they had to start from scratch, which meant more workers and faster harvesting and construction. But it also meant more mouths to feed, so the beavers had to hurry to get their settlement up and running. And of course the beavers didn't have any beds or houses to sleep in, and probably wouldn't for a while. They had to tackle some more important projects first, but the Iron Teeth were just happy to have found such a perfect and safe location to call home. The Folktale family had settled on a new place to call home too. Unfortunately, it wasn't perfect or safe. You see, in the long journey to find a new home, the leader Venjo had passed away, and his grandson, Vrisco, had taken over. And Vrisco had decided that this island's region would be a good place to settle, which made everyone concerned about Vrisco's judgment. It is true that there was a lot of water in this area, but there was a lot of bad water in the mix as well. And there was a limited amount of dry land on which they could build and farm, which could be a problem because the Folktales family was still quite large, even after many beavers had died or left the clan on the journey here. But Vrisco was their leader now, and he had settled them here. Maybe he had a grand vision for the place and saw potential where everyone else saw only difficulty. Or maybe he was just young and foolish and didn't know what he was doing. It's hard to say, but it's not hard to see that this was going to be a challenge for the folktales. But like the Iron Teeth, more beavers meant more workers, who would all need food and water to survive. And there wasn't but so much space to be able to make that happen, but still, getting a farm going was a top priority. The folktales also wanted to harness science quickly, as advances in technology might be the only way these beavers survive. For once, having fewer beavers in the family was turning out to be a benefit for the Iron Teeth. They were pretty quickly eating through the supply of trees, but now that the inventor's hut was completed, the builders could focus on stream-powered industry. The first step was to build a water wheel and connect it to a lumber mill, which would provide them the planks they needed to build a forester's cabin, which would allow them to plant their own trees, which they'd need to build up and expand their settlement. The Iron Teeth had lots of things they needed to build, including the pods, which were the Iron Teeth's gross way of reproducing, also storage, like for their berries. And the lumberjacks had already started on the second patch of trees, if they didn't start planting soon, production would totally stall. Look at those beavers go. Not a bad start for the Iron Teeth on the terrace. It would be nice if they had a place to sleep, but priorities. And though the tree supply was dwindling, a farmhouse was definitely a priority because berries would only last them so long. They needed kohlrabis to feed their large and growing family. Kohlrabis grow quickly, which is good because the berry bushes were dry. Impressive progress for the Iron Teeth. Maybe less so for the folktales. The beavers were moving fast, chopping down trees, planting carrots, pumping water. The folktales were actually moving faster than the Iron Teeth. They had more beavers, but that was the problem. With so many beavers, the whole colony was doomed if they didn't get things up and running soon. They weren't racing the Iron Teeth, they were racing the clock. So they made a path over to the next island. This island had trees, something their island had run out of. The beavers waded across the water and got to work. They needed the logs, but there was an added benefit to harvesting on the adjacent island. More cleared land meant more room for more carrots, which would keep more beavers alive, assuming they could keep themselves hydrated, which was also a struggle. The family was so big they just couldn't get ahead of demand for anything. The beavers were getting hungry waiting for the carrots to grow. They were getting thirsty waiting for the water to pump. They were chopping trees, but they still didn't have a forester to replant. The folktales were in a real delicate position here. 
Whereas the Iron Teeth were stable and kicking things into high gear. They now had storage for their logs and had built a second inventor's hut. Now they were just waiting for their kohlrabis to grow and enough science points to build a forester's cabin. So they could finally start their tree farm. The cabin went up quickly and the forester got to work planting new pine trees. And since they would soon have a fresh supply of logs, the leader Razi decided it was time to build a barracks so they had a place to sleep. The Iron Teeth were hustling and it was paying off and the kohlrabis were ready to harvest, so they had a secure food supply as well. In addition to the pines the forester was planting, Razi wanted to get an early supply of oaks planted, since those took longer to grow but provided more logs per tree. The colony was expanding rapidly, and not just the buildings. The unholy abomination breeding pods were also producing. The Iron Teeth were absolutely thriving in their new home. But that wasn't true at all for the folktales. Yes, they had started work on their first power wheel, so they could build a lumber mill so they could build a forester's cabin. And yes, somehow they were just barely keeping these thirsty beavers hydrated, but the hunger was setting in. You could feel the desperation rising. If the carrots didn't start sprouting soon, the folktales would be done for before they even got started. I mean, that's a lot of hungry beavers. Starving beavers with nowhere to sleep but the carrot fields. It was good Venjo wasn't alive to see this sorry state. And to make matters worse, their rumbling tummies made the beavers work slower, which just compounded the problem. But despite slow progress, the lumber mill was ready, so they could start replanting trees soon. Not that it mattered if everyone starved to death first. Some carrots sure sounded good right about now. What spirit did they need to pray to about that? But luckily, the carrots started sprouting in the night, and the hungry beavers woke up the next morning with a sliver of hope to hold on to. The farmers were moving agonizingly slow, but these were intelligent beavers. They couldn't just start ripping crops out of the ground in a free-for-all. So slow and steady, the harvest began, and the carrots would get eaten up the moment the farmers dropped them off in the farmhouse. A second farmhouse helped with the harvesting, but they weren't out of trouble yet. The bad water was flowing, choking the land, but the iron teeth were safe atop their terrace. They even had a barracks to sleep in, and another one on the way, because a couple beavers were still sleeping on the ground. But better not, the Iron Teeth woke up and went to work with full stomachs, which is more than the folktales could say. They also had a tree farm, which the folktales didn't have either. Of course, they didn't know that. They hadn't even thought about the folktales since the move. And truth be told, they liked the peace and quiet. It was nice to only worry about themselves for a change. The kohlrabi farm was doing great, the tree farm, not so much. The beaver Zoljin was doing his best, but there were a lot of trees to plant. And since the beavers at the lumber mill had been hard at work, Razi had them build a second forester's cabin to finish the job. And trees weren't the only thing on Razi's mind. They were safe from the bad water. But before long, a drought would surely come, and their little stream would go dry, unless they built a dam to hold the water back. The builders got to work, hoping they could finish the job before the season changed. They might have cut it too close. They were still struggling with rampant hunger, but the folktales were trying to think ahead too. They needed to store water before the dry season. So they began work on what would be known as the row, taking advantage of the only deep water section in the area. So worst case, they could keep pumping when everything else went dry. They also finally got their forester's cabin, so they could use one island for crops and the other for trees. The farmers were farming and the water pumpers were pumping, but most of the beavers were still mega hungry. They couldn't even keep up with their basic needs now. What was gonna happen when the drought kicked in? So Frisco had them plant even more carrots and build another farmhouse to help out. On the plus side, they had some sunflowers ready to harvest for a bit of variety. Not that variety mattered if everyone starved to death. It seemed like the beavers were finally stable on water, but the hunger was real. And if they couldn't get it sorted soon, they had no hope of surviving the coming dry season. The danger really hit home the next morning when they found the beaver Yamaki had died of starvation in the night. Poor Yamaki. Sadly, the folktales couldn't even stop to mourn their friend and brother. And then later, the beaver war dog collapsed too, and passed away due to hunger. Was this the beginning of the end for the folktales? Meanwhile, the Iron Teeth were feeling pretty great, because they had finished the dam at the waterfall. So when the drought started and the land dried up, even though their stream had stopped too, the dam held back some water, keeping their land and plants green. At first, it seemed like the bad water would keep flowing during the dry season, suffocating the land with its toxic properties. But actually, the bad water sources had gone dry too. It just took longer for the sludge to clear out. So eventually, the riverbed was completely empty, but not before the bad water had done a number on the landscape. But the Iron Teeth settlement was safe and green, and even celebrating some new, uh, births. With a bit of planning and engineering, the beavers had protected themselves from not only the drought, but the yucky bad water as well. And to top it all off, their tree farm was sprouting, ensuring their future success. 
The folktales weren't feeling very successful. The drought was headed their way too, and the colony was still very hungry. The extra farms and farmers were still struggling to keep everyone fed, to the point they plotted another one on the island that was supposed to be just for trees. Desperate times call for desperate measures, and Frisco was just trying to prevent anyone else from starving to death. And with more and more land going to farming, the folktales wondered where they would even be able to build houses once they were able to. But that was way down the road. Right now, they had to focus on feeding everyone before the river and their crops dried out. Another reason a farm on the tree island made sense was its proximity to deep water, which should keep the crops growing when the other island inevitably dried out. But as the new fields of carrots began sprouting, a shift happened for the colony. Normally, a fresh crop meant the whole family descended on the farmhouses to gobble it up. But this time, the carrots actually started adding up as the farmers brought them in. For the first time, everyone was fed and the folktales had a small surplus of food. And just before the dry season was supposed to start, they had some crops that should keep growing during the drought. But right now, the race was on to stock up as much as they could before the water was gone. And the next morning, the beavers watched as the waterfall in the distance dried up and this wide and open river emptied, turning the green ground brown and infertile, including the land the folktales had worked so hard for. And as expected, the crops dried up, except where they had planted near the deep water. And that bit of green gave them hope. The beavers had gathered a decent stockpile of carrots, but they weren't sure it would last. The family had just gotten used to eating again so they decided to plant even more carrots near the deep water, this time on the riverbed itself. Would it work? Who knew? But it was worth a shot, and definitely better than waiting around. Although, waiting around for the drought to end was basically all the Iron Teeth had done, and it had worked out pretty well for them. Of course, they had a thriving family, a stable food supply, a booming tree farm, a dam, and a stockpile of food and water. All things the folktales didn't have. The separation from the bad water below was like a metaphor. They had risen above the problems of the past, including the folktales. And sure, sometimes life is a mixture of good and bad. But right now, the Iron Teeth were doing pretty darn good. The folktales were doing, well, they didn't want to jinx it. Put it this way, if they could make it through the dry season, they'd be doing great. No one was immediately hungry or thirsty, so that was good. And they were taking advantage of the dry riverbed by chopping down some dead trees down there. And the deep water adjacent farm was sprouting, which was more good news. They still weren't sure if the riverbed carrots would sprout before the water returned, or even if they would need them. But given their recent history, more food sounded better than less. And finally, after the closest call they had ever had, the river waters returned for the folktales too. Say what you will about beavers living on islands, but this view was magical. Of course, the bad water started flowing too, but soon it would all be one big swirling mess, just like life. Sometimes the bad parts sting a little bit, and then sometimes the good comes to wash it away. You don't need to be the perfect family living in the perfect place. You just have to work hard to take care of each other, even if you're still sleeping in the carrot fields. The folktale beavers had survived the dry season after nearly starving to death, and now it was time to replant the fields and get growing again. They also moved their inventor's huts to the neighboring Badwater Island, which admittedly was somewhat dangerous, but would be a great opportunity for them to study the nasty stuff. And the tree farm slash auxiliary carrot farm slash water pumps on the third island were all up and running as well. Although so far there weren't many new trees to chop down. But considering the beavers just barely avoided colony-wide starvation, things were going pretty well. But even with everyone fed, the folktales were still inching towards extinction if they couldn't start growing their family again. It wasn't just about having enough beavers to fill the growing number of jobs. The older generation was beginning to die off, and there hadn't been any new births since they got here. If that didn't change soon, the family would dwindle and die out. So the beavers got to work making more planks so they could build stairs and then build houses on the upper level. If they built enough houses, their population could start increasing for a change. Not to mention the beavers wouldn't be sleeping in the carrot fields anymore, which would be nice. The Iron Teeth weren't dealing with any of those problems. They had water, they had power, they had a healthy farm and a steady supply of food and had enough housing for their whole family and were even adding more. And perhaps most important of all, their colony was safe from the bad water, safe atop a terrace with their very own freshwater stream, high above the bad water flowing in the river below. The Iron Teeth colony was growing, as were some new trees in their tree farm. And the beavers started a gear workshop to continue their expansion. They had bigger and more complex projects in mind and gears were an important part of making them reality. But their plans had already hit a snag because their water wheel couldn't power both industries, so they needed to expand their power network. 
but unfortunately that progress was stalled until more of the trees grew. But waiting for trees wasn't so bad, and the iron teeth were in a really good place. The folktales were not in a really good place. Although things were getting better, the beavers were building houses to save their family line. For the first time since they arrived, some of the folktales got to sleep comfortably indoors. Not all of them, and not nearly enough of them, but the loggers kept logging and the builders kept building. And every night, a few more beavers got to sleep on a bed in a house. And fewer beavers had to sleep on the ground outside. And then their new carrots started sprouting up in a big way, just like the builders had been making their houses sprout up. Building on the higher terrain was a surprisingly smart move by Vrisco. They didn't have to sacrifice their limited farmland. And now almost the entire family was sleeping safely inside. A couple more houses and the family would start growing again. But first the builders had to upgrade their storage, or the farmers wouldn't be able to harvest these new carrots. Because there's no point in regrowing their family just to end up starving like last time. But if everything went to plan, the folktales would soon have both food and housing worked out. The Iron Teeth were working to grow their family as well, even though their methods were unconventional. But apparently, if you mix berries and water, somehow you can grow your own beavers. But while the baby iron teeth were growing, the trees were not. The lumberjack beavers were literally sitting around, and the builders had nothing to build with. And with nothing better to do, some of the beavers got to thinking about their old cousins, the folktales. And that night, with Rosie's permission, a group of beavers set out to do some exploring. And what did they find? The folktales settlement on their little islands, on a different river than the iron teeth, but not that far from their terrace. What were the odds these two families would be near neighbors again? Well, now the Iron Teeth knew where their farmer cousins were, though they weren't sure what they were gonna do about it, yet. The scouting party got back just as the Iron Teeth woke up and got to work, and trees had sprouted up in the night, so the beavers could finish building the power network. The Iron Teeth had a lot to think about, but a fresh supply of logs would keep them busy at home for a while. So the Iron Teeth would focus on their own settlement and leave the folktales alone, for now. The folktales had no idea they were being spied on, and even if they did, they might not have cared. They simply had too much to focus on at home like building more houses. The folktales have been flirting with disaster since they moved here. They didn't have time to think about their old cousins. Thankfully, their log supply had been holding up, and they had quite the carrot stockpile. And even though no beavers had starved, they had lost a number of family members to old age in recent days, which was sad, but also meant they finally had enough housing for the entire family. And for the first time, a new baby had been born, and they named him Outwath. This was truly a turning point for the folktales, and even though the average age in the colony was still quite old, there was a new sense of hope for these beavers, a new pep in their step as they gathered their carrots and built more storage. And since they had the logs to do it, they were just gonna keep erecting houses, because more houses meant more babies. And look at that, there was already a second little guy running around. Hey, little guy. What an impressive turnaround for the folktales family. Maybe there was hope for them yet. It seemed like the Iron Teeth might finally have enough logs to go around, and they could really kick up their industry production. Their kohlrabi farms were doing great, they were pumping plenty of water, they had more berries than they could even store. So maybe it was time to try something new, because everyone knows about trees you plant in the ground, but the Iron Teeth knew of special trees you could plant in the water. So they got to work building some stairs down into their stream, and building a new forester's cabin nearby. And then the beaver Kajavi started planting mangrove trees in the stream. These odd looking trees were an old Iron Teeth family secret, and they would only grow if their roots were fully submerged. And unlike all the other trees they had planted, these ones were not for chopping down, as they would provide a new fruit for the beavers. Since they didn't feel like they needed to compete with the folktales anymore, the leader Razi wanted the family to try new things, even if they weren't the most productive things, which was a bit unusual for Iron Teeth beavers, but this family didn't mind breaking the mold a little bit, so they planted mangroves, and thought about what else they could farm, and how else they could change up their industries. Maybe this would be the beginning of a new, more creative and less rigid kind of Iron Teeth beaver population. In a twist, the folktales had been the more disciplined ones lately, although you can't blame them. They had been on the brink of extinction for a while now, and unfortunately, there was no time to slow down or take it easy, because a drought was coming. Soon the water would dry up again, but the colony was in a much better position this time. And since they were doing okay on logs, Frisco had the builders begin on a new project he had in mind. It seemed like a weird time to start building something that looked like a bridge, but Frisco's design for their houses had absolutely paid off, so the beavers were willing to follow his lead on this. The Iron Teeth had been thinking about creative next steps, like they were supposed to, and had come to a conclusion. The two water wheels were still underpowering their industrial buildings, 
Normally, the solution would be to just attach more wheels, but the Iron Teeth were trying to think outside of the box here. They had an idea, but it was going to take a lot of planks, which meant a lot of logs, and the tree farm had not been their most consistent source. And then Nepokui had to go and injure their foot, so they had to build a medical bed too. And then the log gathering had really come to a halt. But these beavers weren't giving up, they just had to think outside the box. And since two wheels wasn't enough power anyway, why not reallocate those logs toward their creative solution? That way they could at least keep making planks while they waited for their trees to be ready, and their window for making planks was closing. Soon the river and bad water would dry up, and their stream would stop flowing too. The dam would hold back water for the settlement, so the farms would stay green and growing, but when the stream stopped flowing, the water wheel would stop spinning, and the beavers wouldn't have power to make any more planks, and then they would have to wait a whole season to do their big creative project. But the trees were popping up again, so this might work out after all, although they also needed another water pump just to make sure they were covered for the drought. The dry season was upon them, and the iron teeth were ready. The waterfall disappeared in the distance behind the folktales. The wide riverbed surrounding the islands dried up. The fresh water went first, the bad water would follow. And as the water receded, the folktales land and crops went brown, except around the deep pool. The beavers had to hurry to harvest the carrots before they died, but their storage was already full, so the farmers were just sitting around. But too much food was hardly a problem. So if some carrots died, oh well. For a change, the folktales had everything they needed to get through the drought. And the family now had a whopping seven youngsters among them. A strong start for the rising generation. And to think, these beavers were nearly doomed just last season. The dry season had begun for the Iron Teeth as well. And the river was drying up. But of course, the Iron Teeth settlement was fine. They had the dam, and they had enough water stored, but the lack of water flow meant their industry was down. So the question was, had the beavers made enough planks before the stream had stopped flowing to complete the big project they had in mind? And as it turns out, yes, the Iron Teeth had stocked enough planks. And if they hurried, they could get the whole project done during this dry season. And it started with removing the last water wheel and clearing the logs. Then they needed a platform on top of which they would build a large water wheel and connect that to the buildings. This was going to be a huge job. Would the builders be able to finish it before the stream began flowing again? The beavers had made their creative plan. Now they had to hustle to make it a reality. Come on, Iron Teeth. This is your first big project. Bring it home. Speaking of big projects, Vrisco decided it was time to at least explain his big vision. He did want the platforms to make a bridge, but that was just the beginning. Ultimately, he wanted a huge platform connecting the islands, where all their buildings would go. The farmhouses would move to the platform, storage would move to the platform, even the district center would move to the platform. That would let them maximize their land for crops and trees. But obviously, it was a mega project, and that was way down the line. For now, the folktales were only focused on getting through the drought, which was made easier by building near the deep pool. And while they waited for the drought to end, they took on some other projects. They removed the water pumps from the crop island since the row was covering their needs. And since they were good on carrots, they cleared out the dead ones on the riverbed they had planted last dry season. Then the beavers had one more big family dinner and a good night's sleep. And in the morning, they watched the giant waterfall return and bring life back to their islands region. The folktales had done it again. Against all odds, the folktales had survived and come out stronger than before. And now it was time to get to work to make sure they were even stronger by the time the next dry season arrived. The Iron Teeth were hustling to build a large wheel before the water returned. They had the materials, but this was going to be a close one. In other news, the beavers had idle hands and empty fields, so Kajavi began planting some coffee bushes. Coffee was another old family recipe the folktales didn't know about, and another win for creative experimentation by the Iron Teeth. Now if only they could get the new wheel finished. They had worked so hard to gather enough materials, and the builders were working hard to get it done. But it was the end of shift, and the drought would be over the next morning. But what's that? The beavers volunteered to keep working into the night, working in the dark, into the wee hours of the morning, hustling to get the pieces together for a grand reveal. Until, just before daybreak, there it was. The beavers had done it, and just in the nick of time. The exhausted builders rushed to bed as the rest of the colony awoke and took in the sight. The massive wheel loomed over the settlement like a giant ferris wheel, except the beavers couldn't ride it. This wheel just produced power, but still impressive. And that wheel was just the beginning of the Iron Teeth's newfound creativity.
The Iron Teeth were reveling in their success. They had completed their new large water wheel just as the waters returned and brought the region back to life. After a job well done, these beavers slept good that night. But the next day, it was back to work. They now had plenty of power to make planks and gears, and plenty of trees to fell for logs. And the long-awaited oak trees were starting to sprout as well. These massive trees had taken forever to mature, but now would supply the beavers with a huge amount of logs. They could use these in construction, like building better water storage, so the pumpers could really stock up. Speaking of water, Kajavi's mangrove trees were all grown, but hadn't started fruiting yet, so the Iron Teeth family had a lot going for it. Plus, they had several kits growing up, and more babies being... Uh, produced every day. The Iron Teeth family was on the rise. Things were looking up for the folktales as well. They had to replant their carrots after the drought, but at least the water pumpers could get back to work. And since they were reconfiguring their land use, the farmers planted a field of potatoes as well. There were some real challenges to living in this island's region, like the large amount of bad water, the uncontrollable spread of the river, the minimal amount of land available on which to build and farm. But the folktales were feeling optimistic they could overcome, and their leader Frisco had a plan for at least one of those challenges. And now that the dry season was over, they could really get to work. The builders had already started on the bridge between the islands, but they were going to need a lot more planks to realize Vrisco's vision. So they plotted another lumber mill to double their output, but that wouldn't do much good until the tree farm kicked into high gear. And worse still, the one lumber mill was already underpowered. They were going to need a lot more power for two mills, so they made plans to move the existing water wheel so they could add another wheel behind it. This was a big undertaking, but one that should pay off in the long term and enable them to complete Vrisco's plan. The Iron Teeth weren't having any problem with power thanks to their new large water wheel, and they weren't having any problem with logs either. In fact, they had so much power, they decided to build another gear workshop. If they could speed up their production of gears, that would speed up their building plans as well, because their family was growing, and keeping water stock was becoming a problem. But with gears, they could build larger water storage, an important step in protecting their growth. The next day, the new gear shop was up and running, but now the beavers had a different problem. The Iron Teeth were expanding and advancing quickly, but their family wasn't big enough to fill all the new jobs and roles they were trying to add. They wanted more storage, they needed gears to make it happen, but they were constantly having to prioritize jobs and shift workers around to fill gaps. In this case, their unorthodox way of reproducing was actually holding them back. But for now, they were making it work, and shuffling beavers was the name of the game. They could still lay the groundwork now, even if it was a little messy and complicated, and their family would be better off for it once they grew a little more. The Folktale family, on the other hand, was going through a population boom. The houses had been built, and now they were being filled, which was great for their labor force, but was having an interesting effect on the colony. Nearly all the beavers who had migrated to this land had passed away. The new generation of Folktales didn't know the old stories, didn't know about Vinjin and what he had done for them, didn't know about the long feud with the Iron Teeth. The family had changed a lot in a relatively short period, and the old ways and stories had been neglected along the way. Understandable, of course. The beavers had been busy. They had been fighting off extinction since they moved here. The population boom was necessary to survive. And now the beavers were focused on what was next, like Frisco's platforms. Passing down the family history hadn't been top priority for Frisco in the older generation, and it showed. The colony was focused on survival. They didn't have time for much else, and their dedication was paying off as a new crop of carrots popped up and the work on the second water wheel was finally completed, which meant the beavers had enough power to really make progress on Frisco's plan. The family continued to grow, despite the rapid loss of the oldest beavers. And before long, Frisco himself was the last beaver who remembered his grandfather Venjo and the settlement he had led. So maybe now it was time for a new legacy, to give this new generation something they could be proud of too. Frisco's mega platform could be that thing. And with the extra power to their lumber mills, that vision was within reach. The Iron Teeth weren't as concerned with legacy and mega builds at the moment. They had more reasonable tasks to keep them busy, like rearranging their farms and storage, trying to create the perfect layout for their settlement while it was still easy to do. Although they did have one odd situation where their new water wheel just suddenly stopped spinning. Like, stopped spinning entirely. Their entire industry came to a halt for no apparent reason. The wheel had just stopped. The engineers took a look and found that a crucial mechanism had been compromised and broken. But how could that be? The wheel was brand new. How could it have broken already? Unless it had been compromised intentionally. But who would do that? It was a mystery, but for now the beavers focused on fixing the problem. Oh, and some of the coffee bushes had matured. They would still have to wait for the beans, but this was exciting progress. And the builders had fixed the wheel and reconfigured the industries, so everything was rolling again for the Iron Teeth. 
Sunflowers had sprouted. Potatoes were ready for harvest. The Folktale settlement had really stabilized after their near starvation, and Frisco's platform plan was well underway, and more land would be usable soon, assuming their log supply kept up with the growing demand. It wasn't a popular choice when Frisco had the family move here, but you had to admit, these beavers were really settling in and making these islands a suitable home for themselves. So maybe Frisco wasn't such a bad leader after all. And it wasn't long before the first platform-based farmhouse was completed, which meant there was more land available to farm. These beavers were about to totally transform this island. The mega platform would set the colony up for a successful future, all thanks to Risco's unique leadership. I'm not sure Venjo himself could have envisioned moving all your buildings onto platforms to optimize your green land. But here they were, doing just that. Frisco's leadership had really turned this colony around. And for the first time, these folktales felt like they were truly succeeding, that they had a real shot now, thanks to Frisco. And their optimism came at a good time, because a drought was approaching. The Iron Teeth knew about the coming drought too, but they had less reason to be concerned. In fact, they were more interested in how many logs they were bringing in because their tree farm was seriously booming now that the oaks were maturing. They started plotting extra projects just because they could, and of course they would keep their industries running as long as possible. But no, the Iron Teeth were not worried about the drought ahead. Frisco may have proven himself as a folktales leader, but there was never any doubt that Rozzy was leading the Iron Teeth family well. And as they prepared for the coming dry season, everything was going splendidly. Oh, and the mangrove trees were fruiting, little apples were showing up among the leaves, and the Iron Teeth had a new food source to enjoy. They had to reshuffle jobs again, but soon they had a beaver gathering up this new fruit. That was still the one thing holding the family back. Not enough available workers. Every time something came up, like coffee beans being ready to harvest, workers had to be shuffled around to fill the new job. The breeding pods were operational, but the family wasn't growing as fast as they would like. The Folktales had plenty of young, strong worker beavers, but they had another problem. And it wasn't that they were out of logs or that their tree farm wasn't looking so good. This problem was bigger than that. The Folktales' houses were being filled with the cries of baby beavers, but just one day before the drought was supposed to hit, their leader Vrisco passed away peacefully. He was the last of the Exodus generation, the one who had settled them here, the one who had guided their newfound success, the underdog leader who had proven himself worthy. And now he was gone, and the family would have to figure out how to go on without him. The beavers were shocked. This was the new generation's first real loss. But the drought was coming. There was no time to properly mourn. So the beavers agreed to get back to work, to make sure they were ready for the drought, and then have a formal memorial during the dry season. A chance to honor the only leader any of these beavers had ever known. If they had known their history, these folktales would have remembered that Vrisco wasn't the first leader to pass just before a dry season, and that their patriarch Vinjin had passed the same way. But they didn't know their family history. They didn't know it at all. The Iron Teeth were doing what they could to prepare for the dry season. The water wheel was powering the production of a few more planks and gears. The water pumpers were hurrying to fill their new, larger water tanks. The mangrove fruit were being picked, and the food warehouses were being stocked. And don't forget that the tree farm was mega producing. They were so backlogged that some of the pines had started to sap, and they were running out of room to store the logs. Not a bad problem to have, though, and a testament to how well the Iron Teeth were doing. So the beavers finished up a solid day's work and got to bed, and in the morning, the drought started. But of course, the Iron Teeth were fine. They couldn't pump water and they had no power, but they were prepared for that, and everything was fine. But the Iron Teeth spies brought word that the Folktales leader had died, and this news moved Rozzy quite a bit. The Iron Teeth had mostly ignored the Folktales since the resettlement, but the families did have a history, and though they had been enemies, Rozzy was saddened to hear of the passing of the Folktales leader, Venjo. You see, the Iron Teeth didn't know Venjo had already passed. They knew nothing about Vrisco. And so, moved by compassion and a desire to bury the hatchet, Rozzy and his entourage set out to the Folktales settlement to pay respects to their old foe. But he promised to be back before the end of the dry season. The Folktales felt prepared for the drought as well. The water swept away as the river dried up, leaving their land cracked and dry, and most of their plants dying, except for the area around the deep pool. But they had plenty of food and a good amount of water, so they knew they were going to be all right, and also that they could afford to take a break for the planned memorial. They had put it off to prepare for the drought. Now they had the time they needed to properly mourn. So the beavers tidied up and planned to hold the service the next day. It would be a celebration of life, a chance to share memories and to express their gratitude for all Frisco had done for them. And in the morning, when the family gathered for the memorial, 
They were understandably caught off guard when, to their surprise, an envoy of Iron Teeth Beavers arrived at their settlement, bringing gifts and wanting to pay their respects. As the Iron Teeth approached, the folktales were confused, to say the least. They gave the Iron Teeth a wide berth. They weren't sure what to make of this. Eventually, the folktales gave the Iron Teeth a place to sit and rest, while they tried to sort out what to do with this situation. These gray beavers were very suspicious. They didn't even know the name of the leader they supposedly had come to honor. Who were these beavers? Where did they come from? How did they get here? And how did they know the folktales business? The folktales didn't like it, not one bit. But without a leader, they weren't sure what to do. So they made Rozzy and his beavers their prisoners, made a makeshift jail on a neighboring island, and left the poor beavers there until they could sort out what to do with them. Rozzy and his troops were in big trouble, and even worse, the rest of the Iron Teeth back home had no idea. Unlike the folktales, the Iron Teeth did remember their old foes. No one really liked that Rozzy had tried to go make peace, but no one expected the folktales would do something crazy like kidnap their leader and hold him prisoner, so no one was that worried about it. And besides, Rozzy had left them with work to do, and they intended to do it. The family would do their part, and trust that Rozzy knew how to deal with those tricky folktales. Just focus on the work, and Rozzy would be safely home before they even had a chance to miss him. So the beavers tackled their dry season projects, and spent the evening speculating about how Rozzy probably went off on those pesky folktales. They did miss Rozzy a lot. The family wasn't the same without him. But not to worry, he would be home soon. And then to everyone's relief, the river began flowing again. Fresh water came rolling back into the region, bringing back life to the land and plants. The bad water also began bubbling up again, and soon it was flowing through the land as well, mixing with the fresh water into a conflicted blend. The drought was over, and the settlement was back to normal, except that Rozzy hadn't returned like he had promised, and now the Iron Teeth were at a loss. What had the folktales done with Rozzy? The folktales were ready to make the most of a new season. With the river flowing, the beavers could replant their crops and begin pumping drinkable water again. They had pines popping up at their tree farm, and they could turn those logs into planks now that they had more water wheels. And they could use those planks to build the mega platform and fulfill the vision of their recently passed leader, Vrisco. They even had an extra scientist working now. And oh yeah, they had one more important thing. Four iron teeth beavers they had taken prisoner and now had to deal with. Rozzy and his entourage had come in peace, but the folktales were too suspicious and fearful. And now the leader of the Iron Teeth was trapped in a makeshift prison, and the folktales had a dilemma on their, uh, paws. The folktales were currently leaderless, and frankly, they had no idea what to do. They needed someone to take charge and get them back on track. Briscoe's daughter, Vamu, was prepared to do just that, but unfortunately, she needed to prove herself. The beavers weren't sexist or anything, it's just, I mean, Frisco had been a guy, right? But Vamu was popular and convinced the colony to at least hear her out. So the next day, the whole family gathered to listen to Vamu present, but Vamu had a plan to get and keep the family's attention. Blame everything on the Iron Teeth. She claimed that beavers with gray fur can't be trusted, that the beavers who had come with gifts were actually spies, that the Iron Teeth were preparing an attack. Vamu played on the suspicions and uncertainty in her family and gave them an enemy they had to come together to defeat. And of course, since she was the one who brought this threat to their attention, the family agreed that Vamu should be the one to lead them. Though her first act as leader was a confusing one. She let Razi and his men go. The Iron Teeth were beside themselves with worry. Rozzy had promised to be back before the end of the dry season, but he was still missing. And now the beavers didn't know what to do with themselves. They were in a holding pattern, just maintaining what they had. But how long would they have to keep waiting? The colony was leaderless and lacking direction. And more importantly, they were worried about Rozzy and the others. They didn't have proof, but they suspected the folktales had done something treacherous. Rozzy should have never trusted them. He knew what they were capable of. They blew up Ridge of Mayar. Maybe they blew up Rozzy too. But what were the Iron Teeth supposed to do about it? Rozzy had left them with work to do and a promise he would return. Maybe Rozzy had a plan. And if the family jumped into action, they might ruin the whole thing. Or maybe Rozzy was in trouble. And if they didn't act, then Rozzy may never get out of it. What were they supposed to do? They needed more information. But after talking it to death, the beavers agreed on a compromise. They would wait one more day. And if Rozzy wasn't back, they would mobilize the colony and go get him back. 
The Iron Teeth didn't want war, but they weren't afraid to fight, especially to rescue, or avenge, members of their family. The Iron Teeth were strong and ready, but of course they hoped it wouldn't come to war. Of course they hoped this period of peace would continue. Of course they hoped Rozzy would show up safe and sound, that it would all just be a big misunderstanding. But they couldn't count on hopes. They had to prepare for the bad. So they geared up for action while they waited out the day. At sundown, the family would march on the folktales to have it out with their cousins. The family was ready, physically and mentally. So imagine their surprise when, just before sunset, just before the beavers went to war, Rozzy and his compatriots returned to them, safe and sound, but with quite the story to tell. The Iron Teeth were overwhelmed with relief and came together to celebrate and to hear the explanation. Rozzy told them what had happened, how the folktales had all forgotten about the Iron Teeth, how the folktales had imprisoned them, but then they let them go. This upset the family, of course, but Rozzy believed it was a misunderstanding and that peace was still possible and worth pursuing. So for now, the beavers went back to bed, happy to have their leader back with them, content to let the matter sit for now and not jump to conclusions or rush into conflict. Maybe the two families could get along. But the morning rudely interrupted their hopes for peace. Turns out the folktales released Rozzy so they could follow him back to the Iron Teeth settlement, and they left the family with a wet surprise. They completely boarded up their dam, and now the Iron Teeth's little creek was thoroughly flooding the entire settlement, buildings and crops and trees all being drowned in water. And the real irony is that the folktales didn't even remember the time the Iron Teeth destroyed their mega dam and flooded their whole settlement the same way. And make no mistake, this was an act of aggression, just like that had been. Clearly, the folktales didn't want peace. To be fair, the folktales didn't really want war. They just wanted to send a message to show the Iron Teeth who they were dealing with and that they shouldn't be messed with. So yes, Vamu had released Razi just to follow him home, but now they'd made their point and they could get back to work. And perfect timing too, because the oak trees had started maturing. So now they'd have plenty of logs to make plenty of planks to continue with Briscoe's mega platform. So between that and standing up to those sneaky iron teeth, the folktales were feeling pretty good about things. Good enough to focus on new projects and growth. You see, this river was wide and the water just kind of went everywhere. But maybe if the beavers could control the flow, the water would be more useful to them. So Vamu commissioned levees be built to redirect water toward their settlement. They were bringing in plenty of logs, so construction shouldn't be an issue. And it would be a good test to see how the beavers might make the most of their complicated living situation. The folktales were facing a much more challenging region than the Iron Teeth, but they had already overcome a lot, and they weren't afraid of a good challenge. So the builders got to work constructing the levees to block the river from running off in that direction. But progress was on the slow side, and the family had grown a lot, so Vamu assigned more beavers to work as builders. A full builder brigade would finish the levees in no time. Thankfully, the folktales disruption was an easy fix. They just had to break the dam so the excess water could flow downriver, and the beavers would be able to get back to work. The flooding diminished quickly, and soon it was like nothing had happened at all, although they needed to rebuild the dam before the next drought or the colony would be in big trouble. And though the water had subsided quickly, the Iron Teeth's anger did not. They already wanted revenge for what happened to Rozzy, and the flooding only motivated them more. So they gathered to ask Rozzy what the plan was for retaliation, but to their surprise, Rozzy told them to wait. They couldn't lose focus on their own progress, their own growth. They couldn't sacrifice that just to get back at the folktales. They had a dam to build. They had added a new farmhouse and planted a field of cassavas. And they were about to begin work on something big, a second large water wheel. The Iron Teeth wanted to invest heavily into industry, and for that they needed even more power. So they couldn't drop everything and go fight with the folktales right now. But Razi assured them they would make a move soon, if they could just be patient. The folktales had their eye on a potential problem. Their family was growing, but their food supply was shrinking. They had nearly starved to death before, and they did not want to go through that again. Luckily, the next morning, a fresh crop of carrots had begun sprouting. So they weren't in a dire situation at the moment, but it was something to stay on top of for sure. Meanwhile, the builder's hut had been completed, so there was now double the number of builders in the colony, and they were making good progress on the levees. Each completed piece redirected water toward the settlement, and already the beavers felt they were wading in deeper water. And the water Water wheels seemed to be spinning a little faster and cranking out a bit more power. After struggling through near starvation and a generational death wave, these beavers were finally accomplishing the most basic of beaver tasks, building dams to control and benefit from the flow of water. There was one unexpected outcome from this project though. As the beavers built levees to stop the flow of water in this direction, that meant the only thing left on that side was the bad water. 
they had increased the concentration of good water on their side of the levees, which was great for their settlement now, but that increased the concentration of bad water on the other side of the levees. Hopefully that wouldn't be a problem for them later, but Vamu was happy with the short-term win. Speaking of wins, the Folktales were building more and bigger housing to continue their growth, and enough of the mega platform had been built to finally relocate the district center. Now even more of the land was available for farming, and the district center stood on the mega platform like a monument to their success. The the larger house was finished, their food supply was doing okay, and there was more food being harvested. Overall, these beavers were really crushing it. And the cherry on top, the folktales had stuck it to the iron teeth and really shown them who they were dealing with. They weren't expecting to have any more unwanted visitors or problems from those stupid gray beavers. And for now, they wouldn't have any problems from the iron teeth. Rozzy was still asking the family to wait and focus on work while he formulated a plan. They had trees to chop down, and plenty of logs to build with, and a second water wheel under construction. But secretly, Rozzy was still hoping they could avoid war, so he didn't want to escalate things. Surely war wasn't inevitable, right? And look at that, the cassavas were ready! So it was time to build a fermenter to make those cassavas into an edible treat. This was meaningful progress for the Iron Teeth, and not just another thing to distract them from wanting revenge on the folktales. Man, Rozzy really wanted to give Peace a chance. But would he be able to keep control of his family? Maybe if they all enjoyed the deliciousness of fermented cassavas, they would forget all about it. And though the beavers did like the new treat, even Rozzy knew it wasn't enough to distract the Iron Teeth. The beavers wanted their revenge, and it didn't seem like they would settle for anything less. They were willing to listen to Rozzy. They were willing to be patient. They were willing to do the work while they waited to build the water wheel and ferment the cassavas and do whatever else Rozzy told them to do. But then, they wanted to teach those folktales a lesson. Rozzy tried to hype up the progress. They had enough power now to greatly expand their industries, but the Iron Teeth never lost sight of their revenge. And now Rozzy had a problem. If he gave the family what they wanted, it could hurt them in the long run. But if he didn't give the family what they wanted, it could lead to an all-out rebellion. The folktales weren't in the mood for a revolt, but they wouldn't say no to a new tasty treat because they had been farming potatoes, but you can't eat those raw, and they had stored up quite a few of them. So they set out to build a grill which could cook the potatoes. And with the Builder Brigade on it, these beavers would have grilled potatoes in no time. Just needed the potatoes and some logs, and there you go. But then the colony had their first injury when the beaver Jalai hurt their tail, so the builders had to make some medical beds so he could recover. The folktales were on a roll, and it was time to tackle something new. Bamu commissioned a bridge to the Badwater Island, and the Builder Brigade got to work making it happen. If they played it right, they could have a whole network of bridges and platforms. Oh, and the grilled potatoes were insanely popular, as expected. And as excited as the folktales were to be firing on all cylinders, there was still a looming danger hanging over the settlement. The beavers needed to prepare, because a drought was coming. And droughts have a way of really messing things up for unprepared beavers. Rozzy had the Iron Teeth build a hauling post so that any unemployed beavers could get to work hauling materials to job sites. He had the builders construct another water pump so they could top off their tanks. He installed a shower where the beavers could wet their fur. Ah, that's nice. Rozzy was desperate to delay the conflict as long as possible, indefinitely if he could. So he kept finding jobs to do, trying to distract his family from their thoughts of retribution. He might not be able to dissuade them from wanting revenge, but at least he could keep them busy. As long as he didn't overextend their trust or tip his own hand, this might work. So far, conversations were still revolving around the folktales. No one was speaking out against Rozzy, so keep him busy. That was Rozzy's strategy. They built rooftop terraces, a new and improved model. Surely that was enough to demotivate these beavers from their pursuit of vengeance. But no, the Iron Teeth still seemed set on their plan. And then, just when Rozzy had completely run out of ideas, a drought was approaching. An odd thing to be excited about, to be sure, but it was something else for the family to worry about, and not something Rozzy had contrived for a change. Maybe, just maybe, this would finally cool the Iron Teeth's frustrations. The folktales were preparing for the coming dry season. They were harvesting the last of the crops, they had a decent amount of food stocked up, and their water storage was all topped off. The builders were almost done with the new bridge, and they had a good supply of logs to use during the drought. They were as ready as they were going to be, and hopefully this dry season would be short and painless. One more good night's sleep, and the next day, the drought began. 
The river dried up, except near the deep pools, and the land and crops went dry. The beavers were used to it at this point, but thank goodness they were next to a deep pool. The crops were dead, but they should have enough food, and they could keep grilling potatoes during the drought. So they got to work rearranging their industry, since the water wheels were shut down anyways, and that got them thinking about what else they could accomplish before the water came back. This whole region was one big unruly riverbed, but the folktales had already proven they could control it if they were strategic. Maybe they could implement even more strategy. But they were getting ahead of themselves. The lumber mills weren't operational, but they had a small stockpile of planks. So they built a way further up the hill to build more houses. Not the most glamorous project, but it was important. And their little village was starting to look pretty cool. And once they were finished building, they still had plenty of logs, so they added another lumber mill. And then they still had logs. So they took the plunge and started building more levees on the other side of the settlement this time. This wasn't going to redirect that much of the river, but it was a start. And if the beavers hurried, they could finish the levees before before the dry season ended. Of course, the drought affected the terraces region as well, and much of the area turned brown as the river dried up. But since the Iron Teeth had repaired their dam, things didn't change much for them. Their water wheels stopped, so their industries shut down, and they had to stop the water pumps. But for the most part, things were normal. Too normal. The beavers were tired of waiting. They brought a formal grievance to Rozzy on behalf of, well, literally everyone except Rozzy. They demanded that Rozzy take action against the folktales, and it was heavily implied that the consequence of inaction would be mutiny. And now Rozzy truly had a conundrum on his paws. Risk the family's well-being by acting on their demands, or risk his own neck to protect his family? The Iron Teeth were giving him till the end of the dry season to decide, and Rozzy was understandably avoiding his family as much as possible, but it certainly seemed like war was inevitable. So would Rozzy endorse it and lead them, or oppose it and be removed as leader? He had tried his best to distract his family, to put off the decision as long as he could, but Rozzy couldn't avoid it any longer. He had to answer to the family, so he called the beavers together to share his big announcement. The folktales were almost successfully through the dry season once again, and they were nearly done with the levees. It wasn't a huge project, but it was nice to get it done in a timely fashion. Vamu had led the family well this season, and they were glad they had agreed to follow her. Not only had they succeeded at home, but they had fired a warning shot at the Iron Teeth. No way that was going to blow up in their face, right? There was a big hullabaloo at the Iron Teeth settlement. The family had given Rozzy a deadline, and now they were all gathered to hear what he had to say. The whole colony had put their jobs on hold to listen to Rozzy's big speech. Their leader had been playing games, but now it was time to decide. Would Rozzy lead them to war against the folktales, or would he step down as leader of the colony? Iron Teeth! Rozzy began. Our colony is in danger. We are faced with a threat that could destroy us completely. It could end our settlement, undo all that our hard work has accomplished, and destroy our very way of life. We must act now to prevent this danger, or all may be lost. But this threat is not the folktales, nor another enemy around us. The danger we face is the uncertainty of this war you seem to want. We must not take this risk. We must not go to war. I have not led you wrong before, and I am not wrong now. As your leader, I am telling you, we must pursue peace. Rozzy spoke for a long time. He praised the family for their resilience and determination, and recalled how they had overcome every obstacle they had faced. But he reminded them of the sacrifices they had made while feuding with the folktales before, the pain and hardship, even the loss of their leader, Rija Mayar. And he implored them to resist their urge to go to war again. Rozzy talked the whole day, and the beavers listened intently to every word. And as the day and Rozzy's speech came to an end, the family returned to their campfires to discuss everything that Rozzy had said. Rozzy was an eloquent and compelling speaker, but had he convinced the Iron Teeth to change their mind? If you'd asked them, the folktales would have confidently said they could handle a war with the Iron Teeth. But in reality, these beavers were about to face a different problem. With the river flowing again, they could get to replanting their crops and pumping water. Their trees were growing again, so they would have logs for building. But a situation had grown dire while the folktales had been keeping themselves busy. They were completely out of food. The farmers were replanting the fields as quickly as they could, but they would still have to wait for the plants to grow, and the colony was completely out of food now. They didn't even have potatoes to grill while they waited for new crops to grow. This could be a big problem for the folktales. The family had grown a lot recently. They had a lot of stomachs to fill and nothing to fill them with, and already beavers were getting hungry. It was going to be a rough couple of days for the colony, but their leader Vamu encouraged everyone to hang in there and focus on work. 
Maybe she could spin it as a family weight loss program or something. The Beavers were going to be struggling physically, so it would be important to keep their spirits up. Bamu couldn't have the whole colony falling apart on her, or worse, talking about mutiny. Hungry Beavers tend to make rash decisions, after all. The next day, the Iron Teeth filed into Rose once again, but this time it wasn't to hear Rosie speak. This time, Rosie was on trial. That's right, even after hearing his day-long speech, the Beavers wanted to oust their leader, Rosie. They were dead set on retaliation against the Folktales, and if Rosie wouldn't lead them there, they would find someone who would. So they assigned three Beavers to judge as impartially as they could, and the trial of Rosie began. And boy, did the Iron Teeth have some accusations to throw at their leader. Yesterday had been Rosie's chance to speak. Today, it was the family's turn to speak their mind. And just about every beaver wanted a chance to speak out against Rosie. Some of them spoke with anger, some of them spoke with sadness and disappointment, but none of them defended Rosie or his call for peace. They thought Rosie should have been leading the charge for retaliation. He was the one that was wrongfully imprisoned. The whole family was rallying on his behalf, wanting to stand up to the folktales. And Rosie was telling them no? Of course the beavers were feeling angry and betrayed. And now they directed those feelings into formal accusations in a beaver court of law. And they accused, and they accused, and they accused the whole day long. Until finally, the judges made their verdict. The court was dismissed, and in conclusion, Rozzy was put in a temporary jail cell. They weren't imprisoning him per se, but he had been removed as leader, and they felt that warranted some amount of public disgrace. The family felt a combination of relief and disgust, but what was done was done, and it was time to focus on the new decisions ahead of them. Who would replace Rozzy, and how would they get back at the folktales? Of course, if the folktales didn't get their food situation under control, there would be nothing left for the Iron Teeth to get back at anyway. They were still following Vamu's directive and focusing on work to distract from their hunger. But the fact was, they had no food. The farmer beavers had done a great job replanting their crops, and soon they would have a massive harvest to feast on. But for now, it was just a waiting game, because they had no food. Not to mention that the baby beavers didn't have jobs to distract them, and their poor hungry tummies grumbled loudest of all. The folktales were in a pickle. Actually, no, being in a pickle would solve their problem. The folktales were in a bad place, a pickleless place. For the second time, the family was facing starvation. Between the limited land and the complete dry out every season, the beavers were really struggling to farm this region and create a stable food supply. And the result was devastating. But if they could just quiet their stomachs and focus on work, focus on the water pumping, focus on building a dam to redirect the river, focus on producing planks at the mills and chopping down trees for logs, they just had to hold out a little longer. But that little longer felt like forever, especially for the kids who didn't have a job, or the farmers whose job literally was to sit around and wait for the crops. The folktales hadn't lost hope, but at some point hope can't fill your stomach, you know? At least no one was blaming the leader Vamu. The grumbles of their stomachs drowned out any dissent in the family. But if they didn't get something to eat, and soon, then Vamu might not even have a family to lead. The Iron Teeth Beavers had some catching up to do. They'd spent two whole days on speeches and trials. Now it was time to get back to harvesting crops and pumping drinking water, gathering berries and chewing trees. Lots to do to get back on track, not to mention they needed a new leader now that Rosie had been ousted. Poor Rosie had been thrown in jail, first by the folktales, now by his own family, all because he wanted the beavers to live in peace. But the Iron Teeth didn't want peace. They wanted a leader who would help them fight a war against their folktale cousins. Rosie wasn't going to be that leader, so now they needed someone new. The Iron Teeth weren't big on voting. They valued strength, not popularity. Usually the strongest or strongest willed beaver among them would assume leadership. And if more than one beaver wanted to take the mantle, the family would devise some sort of contest to determine the true leader. Razi himself had become leader after winning a contest. But now a beaver named Azra had declared his intention to lead. And of course he rallied support by making it clear he would fight back against the folktales. Which meant any beaver who tried to challenge him would look like they were a folktale sympathizer. Which meant Azra was unopposed as he was promoted into leadership. Popularity may not have been an Iron Teeth value, but it was certainly a tool to use. The folktales were still waiting, waiting on the crops that would fill their empty stomachs and keep them alive. In the meantime though, they finished the next segment of dam, which may or may not actually help with their dry season problem. It seemed like a success to better funnel water toward their settlement to water their fields and power their wheels, but the funnel still had an exit, so the water would still flow away during a drought. So why not dam the exit? Make it so the water couldn't escape. Maybe that would be enough to keep their land green. So Vamu put the builders to work on that next, still trying to distract them from their hunger. But distractions weren't going to be enough anymore. A beaver named Elva died of hunger. The family was taken aback. Things were about to get really bad. 
a beaver named Pajati collapsed and died right in the middle of the pathway. Right in the middle. Another beaver down. This was really happening. This was... Oh, another beaver down. A sense of dread fell upon the family. It was bad enough to see a loved one succumb to hunger, but knowing you could be next... Another beaver fell. It was like a bad dream, and these beavers would give anything... Another death. This was bad. A beaver fell in the sunflower fields. Beavers were dropping on their way to bed now. What a tragedy. Oh, there goes another one. By the time the beavers all got to bed, 13 of them had died to hunger. But there was hope for tomorrow because the carrots had begun to sprout. So the Iron Teeth had sorted out their leadership problem. Rozzy was still in jail, by the way. And now the beavers wanted to know how they were going to finally get revenge on the folktales. Their new leader, Azra, had a plan, but he needed the colony to begin a new expansion first. Azra commissioned a suspension bridge, a first for the Iron Teeth. This bridge would extend over the river and connect their terrace to the terrace behind the settlement, because that terrace was close to a huge old ruin where they could get metal. Ironically, Azra may have stolen this plan out of Rozzy's idea notebook, but Azra said metal would equip the beavers to properly retaliate against the folktales, so no one even questioned it. In fact, they were all excited about this new direction, even though nothing had actually changed. Meanwhile, Rozzy was still in jail and had to sleep in the dirt because they had mostly forgotten about him. But in the morning, the suspension bridge was finished and it looked awesome, which meant the beavers could begin the next phase, constructing a giant staircase down to the ruins. It was a big job, but it was the simplest way for them to reach the metal. And the family poured out their praise for Azra and his leadership, even though it was probably Rozzy's idea. But it was Azra who was promising revenge on the folktales. And that made all the difference. The beavers could work their farms and build massive bridges all day long so long as they knew they were getting their revenge at the end of the day. And at the end of this day, Azra gathered the troops for an opening raid to harass the folktales. But they didn't know what had been going on at the folktales settlement. Thirteen beavers had never made it to bed, and the carrots were popping up, but could they stop this death wave before it was too late? They had held off their hunger for so long, and it seemed cruel that starvation would take them now when food was finally becoming available. But the family was losing beavers left and right, and before the farmers had even picked the first carrots, 24 of them had succumbed. And it kept happening. It was like a bloodless bloodbath, as beavers' stomachs growled their last, and beavers collapsed to the ground. The family was in trouble. By mid-morning, they had lost 31 beavers. The carrots were growing and the farmers were moving as fast as they could, but the situation was desperate. The family was too large and the hunger was too great. Some beavers got to have lunch for the first time in days, but 33 beavers were not so lucky. The farmers were pulling carrots non-stop, which of course would be gobbled up immediately, but the death toll had now climbed to 35 beavers. To the farmer's credit, two deaths in the afternoon was a huge reversal from that morning. They were nearly out of the woods, but the pendulum had to swing just a little more before it reached equilibrium. In just 24 hours, the folktales had lost two-thirds of their family, the single most catastrophic day these beavers had ever faced. This wasn't even the first hunger wave the folktales had experienced, but this was so, so much worse than the last time. But with a bit of food in their tummies, the beavers were cautiously optimistic that it was all over, that they would all wake up the next day to pick up the pieces after this devastating turn of events. And awake they did. The final death count was 36 beavers. Their family had shrunk by a huge amount, but at least they had stopped the death wave. Vamu had survived, and most of the children, but in addition to mourning their loved ones, the colony was now hamstrung by a lack of working beavers. Obviously, the priority was still stabilizing their food supply, but the road back to a fully functioning settlement would be long. This was the smallest the family had been since they moved here. Their big settlement was now uncomfortably empty and quiet. It was a dark day for the folktales, in grief over their lost family, depressed over their lost progress, and yet have Having no margin to pause from work. The folktales were not in a good place, but at least some of them were still alive. Hopefully nothing else bad was heading their way. The folktales were recovering from their traumatic death wave. The farmers were stocking up on food and the water pumpers were stocking up on water. But otherwise, the colony was pretty quiet because the recent starvation had claimed two thirds of their family. So their once thriving settlement was on life support. Maybe once the harvest was finished, they could reassign workers. But until more babies showed up and grew up too, the colony was severely handicapped. And another threat was looming over the settlement. 
the Iron Teeth had arrived to get their revenge. A whole army of them had set up on a hill overlooking the colony, and they were ready to make the folktales pay. But the Iron Teeth were surprised by what they saw at the folktale settlement. They didn't know their cousins had gone through such a difficult time, and honestly, it made them stop and think. Were they really going to cause trouble after the folktales had been through so much pain? So, after all that excitement and prep, the Iron Teeth decided to call off the attack rather than take their revenge as planned. The folktales were safe for now. The Iron Teeth returned home a little disappointed, to be honest. Retaliation had been such a focus for the colony lately. It had become their main motivation. It was all anyone had talked about in recent days. They had even replaced their leader over it. It was that important to them. And now it just hadn't happened. All that enthusiasm and nothing to show for it. No payoff, no satisfaction. Genuinely the most anticlimactic thing that these beavers could remember ever happening. Or not happening. Maybe Rozzy had been right all along. Maybe pursuing war was always going to end in disappointment. They weren't willing to admit they were wrong, but they decided to at least let Rozzy out of the jail. But what were they supposed to do now? Were they just supposed to go back to work? Keep farming the land? Keep building the projects? But for what? Getting back at the folktales had given them a goal, a focus. It wasn't their fault that so many of their cousins had starved. They didn't want to inflict more pain, but now they just felt directionless. I mean, why were they even building this giant staircase to the ruins? Why had they built this? What is this, an oil press? Oh, right, that turns canola seed into canola oil. Okay, that one makes sense. But still, what was the point? The Iron Teeth didn't know what to think or what to feel anymore. The folktales could relate. They had just lost two-thirds of their family and had gone through their own period of numbness. But now, it actually felt like things were turning around, especially with the new babies running around the settlement. Oh, and they had been so busy and numb the past few days, they hadn't even noticed the almost invasion by the Iron Teeth. It was one day at a time for these beavers, with a hope that each day would be better than the last. The hardest part was over. Now they needed to rebuild which was definitely a challenge with the family significantly shrunk. But they did the best they could with what they had, and each day without a death was another day in the right direction. Now that their food and water supplies were stable, they were able to allocate beaver power back to other things, like chopping down trees so they would have more logs, and turning those logs into planks at the lumber mill, and even continuing with the dam project they had begun before everything fell apart on them. Maybe, just maybe, they would recover from this. They had dodged a bullet with the iron teeth, Though again, they didn't even know that had happened. And now they were actually making some amount of progress. The numbness had been replaced by a hopefulness once again, and they wanted to honor their lost beavers by not giving up. A new sense of motivation came over the family, and they were gonna need it because a bad tide was approaching. The Iron Teeth were still too unsettled to think about bad tides. They had continued with their work and pushing forward with projects. And thanks to some advice from Rozzy, the Iron Teeth were starting to rethink things, to get back to the basics of being a beaver. They had gotten pretty caught up in the whole revenge thing, and it was good to take a step back, especially since the revenge hadn't panned out. Maybe Rozzy had been right all along. But oh look, the staircase was done, so they could focus on that instead of trying to decide whether or not they were wrong. They hadn't gone through with the attack, they were coming out of their funk, did they really need to admit they made a mistake and that they should have listened to Rozzy? Couldn't they just skip that part and move on, act like nothing happened? They had let Rozzy out of jail, wasn't that enough? Anyway, the scavengers were getting to work on the ruins, stripping the metal so they could use it for their own purposes. It was a big ruin, so it would last them a while. Oh, and they decided to double their baby beaver production. So between making progress and trying to shirk accountability, yeah, the Iron Teeth were turning things around. So a bad tide was coming, but the folktales didn't really know what that meant. All they knew were droughts. Was it something like that? Well, if it was like a drought, they really needed to finish the dam. Actually, dams had helped with the bad water already, and they had topped off their water storage, and the farmers were harvesting an abundance of food. They were well prepared for a drought, so if this bad tide was anything like that, the beavers would be ready and would handle it with ease. But again, they didn't know what a bad tide really was, so Vamu directed them to do what they could, and soon the first phase of the dam was finished, and as an unintended consequence, the water wheels completely stopped turning. But maybe once they finished the next phase of the dam, that would self-correct? And it's not like they even had enough beavers to worry about industry right now anyway. The family had lost a lot, and almost lost even more to the Iron Teeth. 
They did not want to lose it all to this bad tide. But again, they didn't really know what a bad tide was. So they were making preparations, but without any real direction. They already had bad water flowing all around them. Would it bubble up even more or something? This region had been a challenge ever since Frisco had moved them here. They still didn't have a good solution to droughts, and now they had to deal with something called a bad tide? All the folktales wanted was a quiet place to live where they wouldn't starve to death. Was that too much to ask? Apparently it was, so the beavers kept doing what they could to prepare. The bad tide would be here soon, and they wanted to be as ready as they could be. The main thing was finishing the dam, but they also had some sunflower seeds to harvest up for some food variety during the drought, I mean bad tide, and they had to make sure they were all stocked up on water. These beavers had already made an impressive recovery from that death wave. It would be a pity if it all ended now, and they were nearly done with the dam. Maybe it would be enough to save them from whatever was going to happen with the bad water. The Iron Teeth had not read the signs that a bad tide was coming, but also, they probably wouldn't have cared. They had easily handled every dry season so far. They weren't worried, even though the Iron Teeth, like the folktales, didn't actually know what a bad tide was or how they were supposed to prepare for it. They had a good thing going with their farms, and they were finally bringing in the scrap metal, and their terrace was way above the bad water below. What's the worst that would happen? They were more interested in stocking up on scrap metal and smelting it down into usable iron bars. The Iron Teeth were heading into a new age of industry. They weren't worried about what the bad water was going to do, and they thought they were prepared for anything. They had built lots of storage, they had plenty of food and water, their family was healthy and growing. Nah, they weren't worried about the next season. They had finally snapped out of their funk, and they were full steam ahead. Too focused to even notice that this wouldn't be just a dry season. But when they had this stable of a settlement, they had nothing to worry about. Or so they thought. The Folktales had one more night before the bad tide hit. They had done all they could to prepare. Now it was time to get one more good night's rest and hope and pray this wasn't the end for their family. The next morning, the bad tide began. And the Folktales were horrified by what they saw. The entire river was turning red. It wasn't that the bad water was bubbling over. All the water was turning bad. And that was not good. The bad water would choke out the land, killing the plants and trees as it pushed out the good water. But something interesting was going on at the settlement. The bad water wasn't taking over as quickly. It was definitely creeping in, but there was still a lot of fresh water too. The bad water wasn't pushing out the good water as fast, and the good water was diluting the bad water and its effects. And then suddenly they realized the nearly finished dam was restricting the flow of water. That's why the fresh water was lingering, and that was kind of saving their settlement actually, because the diluted water was still keeping their land green. The beavers had inadvertently created a sort of fresh water Water reservoir. Turns out the dam was a solution to the bad tide, but it wasn't a perfect one. The land was slowly drying out. The fresh water was still being pushed out, just more slowly. The builders did finish the dam, which would help, but would it be enough? Only time would tell. The roller coaster ride continued for the folktales. And then, to everyone's surprise, the next morning, the waterfall began running blue again. The bad tide had only lasted one day, and now the good water was pushing out the bad water. What a quirky circle of life. Except there was one problem. The Folktales Dam was stopping the flow of water, and the freshwater reservoir was now acting as a bad water reservoir. The river was now flowing around the settlement instead of through it, and the bad water wasn't getting washed away. So after all that, they had to break part of the dam to resume the flow of water, which coincidentally got the water wheels spinning again. Overall though, the Folktales handled the bad tide remarkably well. Luckily it had only lasted one day this time, and the fresh water pushing in would get everything back to normal. It had been a wild ride for the Folktales recently. But they had survived through it all and had proven their determination. The bad tide had come to the Iron Teeth settlement as well, and to their surprise, their stream began spewing bad water. Not only that, but it was flooding onto their land. The Iron Teeth had been confident they were prepared for anything, but they were not prepared for this. The bad tide was pushing out the fresh water and overflowing into their settlement. This was shaping up to be a big mess. With flashbacks to the last time they had to leave their settlement, the bad water was going to poison their land and clog up their water pumps. And who knew what it would do to the beavers who were scrambling to gather resources before it was all ruined. The bad water had taken over their stream and the greenery was disappearing all around them. Thankfully the flooding subsided, but it wasn't over yet. The only positive of the bad tide was that the water wheels were still going. So theoretically the beavers could continue running their industries, but that wasn't especially high on their priorities list right now. As they watched their plants 
withering right before their eyes. The flooding had stopped, but the bad water was still poisoning the ground, and that could have a lasting impact on the colony. The bad tide was affecting the iron teeth much more than it had affected the folktales, and there wasn't really anything they could do about it. The bad water was ruining everything, except the scrap metal gathering, I guess that was still fine. But overall, things were bad. At least the day was coming to a close. It had been a challenge, but they made it through. And wouldn't it be nice if the fresh water returned tomorrow? But actually, it didn't. The bad tide continued on into the second day, though we're not sure why. And the Iron Teeth had to continue on as well, even though they didn't know what to do. Their plants were dead or dying, their water pumps were well and truly clogged, and the bad water had a particularly bad smell. Kind of like if you put rotten eggs in an oven. So the beavers suffered through another day. They were still collecting scrap metal, and the farmers were harvesting the last kohlrabis that hadn't died yet, but most of the beavers had nothing to do. This was way worse, and more gross, than a drought. They really had thought they were prepared for anything, and their settlement didn't need any more improving. Had Rozzy really been right this whole time? The Iron Teeth had lost their focus, turned all their attention to the folktales, and even made Azra the leader of their colony, when this whole time they could have been building up and preparing for something like this. And now they were stuck with the consequences. What kind of example were they setting for their children? The beavers would probably be fine as long as the bad tide ended soon, but they needed to do some soul searching. They needed to come together on what their family was about. The bad tide had many beavers wanting to refocus, but some still didn't want to give up the feud. And as the sun set on their smelly settlement, they were a house divided. They had lost the unity that made them strong. What were they gonna do now? The Iron Teeth had been having a particularly challenging time, but thankfully the next morning, the bad tide ended. Their little stream atop the terrace began pouring out fresh water again, and the fresh water returned to the river below as well. And as the fresh water pushed out the bad water, the earth came alive again. The ground turned green and was ready to be replanted, not to mention the terrible smell was being carried down river as well. And the Iron Teeth were back in business, replanting the dead crops and the lost trees, pumping drinking water again, and getting to shower for the first time in days. There was a lot to do before things were back to 100%, but the Iron Teeth had successfully made it through their first bad tide. But what about the family division the Iron Teeth had been facing? After taking pity on the folktales and then being very unprepared for the bad tide, many of the beavers thought they needed to reprioritize and get back to beaver basics. But not everyone felt that way. Some of the beavers still had a bone to pick with the folktales and wanted to keep focused on their feud. A vendetta against the folktales had unified and motivated the Iron Teeth like nothing else. But now the family was very much split about what they should do. They had to figure it out. And soon. The folktales were feeling encouraged after the bad tide. They'd had to break their new dam to get rid of the bad water, and the land wasn't turning back to green as fast as they wanted. But overall, they made it through just fine. Vamu had led the family well through a new challenge, though the water around them was still uncomfortably red. But their family was now growing at record pace. So many little beavers running around. It was adorable. But more importantly, it meant they'd soon fill their vacant jobs, like the inventor huts and the lumber mills. And with the farmers stockpiling food and the lumberjacks, Jacks bringing in new logs, the family was on the verge of massive expansion, and it was all going to start with fixing this dam. The Iron Teeth had a plan, and the next day, the whole family gathered to hold a formal debate about the direction, leadership, and future of their colony. On the one side was Razi and the beavers who supported peace. On the other was Azra and the beavers who wanted to continue the feud. The family was pretty evenly split, and it was up to Razi and Azra to convince the beavers on the other side. Razi went first, and he spoke passionately. He reminded the family, again, of their history and the progress they had made when they pulled together for the good of the colony. Razi's words were convincing, and several beavers switched sides to favor a peaceful future. The majority was on Razi's side, but now it was Azra's turn to speak. Azra brought up history as well, the history of pain the folktales had inflicted, how their cousins had attacked and abused them so many times, and how they needed to stand up for their family pride. And unfortunately for Razi, Azra's speech convinced even more beavers to switch sides. Razi had lost the support he had gained and then some. Only a few beavers still wanted peace. The majority of them now supported continuing the fight. Razi and Azra had argued well, and they weren't done, but the day had now come to a close and the beavers were dismissed for the night. And not surprisingly, the beavers all went home and continued to discuss the events of the day. Would the family ever come to agreement on this?
Things were nearly back to normal at the folktale settlement. Almost all the land was green again, and the water was looking comfortably blue. The beavers were lucky the bad tide had only lasted one day, and now they wanted to make sure they were prepared for any bad tides that would come their way in the future. And of course, that meant fixing the dam. But Vamu had a plan. Redo the whole thing. So the builders got to work. They had plenty of materials to work with, and this design made a lot of sense. This dam featured floodgates, which could be raised or lowered as needed. So when the river was normal, they could lower the gates to keep the water flowing and wheels turning. But if a bad tide was coming, they could raise the gates so the river would go around them. It was actually a pretty clever plan. Now they just needed to make it a reality. This was exactly the sort of thing the beavers needed to kickstart a new season of growth, to finally bounce back from the death wave and really start succeeding again. Was this the beginning of a new chapter for the folktales? Meanwhile, at the Iron Teeth settlement, the beavers were gathering for another day of debate. The split was still heavily favoring Azra, but Razi had something up his sleeve. He looked out at the beavers who wanted war and started making promises. He promised them that peace would bring prosperity. He promised they would see agricultural growth, economic growth, industrial growth, family growth, every kind of growth if they would just side with him and give peace a chance. Together, they could make their home the best that it could be. They just had to decide it was important enough. And wouldn't you know it, but Razi's speech worked. Wait, nope, a bunch of beavers were making a snack run? But they came back, and they did side with Razi after all. Now Razi and the peaceful beavers were the majority, and Azra's support had dwindled. But Razi had just given Azra his playbook. If Razi could make grand promises, Azra just had to offer even more. He looked across at the beavers now wanting peace, and explained how much easier it is to take than to work because the Iron Teeth were going to win the feud, and then there would be a whole folktale settlement that would be theirs to take. They could even take over and create an Iron Teeth satellite campus. Talk about growing their family. And Azra promised he would deliver. That speech got beavers moving again, though some wanted a snack, but ultimately they did side with Azra, and now the family was split down the middle again. Two days later and they were back where they started. The debate was dismissed, and the beavers went home feeling frustrated and confused. As they gathered around their campfires to debrief from the day, one thing was very clear. Most of the beavers were genuinely on the fence, and that's why they kept flip-flopping. They just didn't have enough information. They didn't even know if the folktales still wanted to feud. How could they be expected to make this big decision? But maybe that was it. Maybe that was the solution. They would invite the folktales to meet to see where the family stood. That would be the information they needed to decide the future of their colony. The folktales were not feeling the same disunity as the Iron Teeth. If anything, these beavers were feeling more unified than usual, and it was not because they wanted to feud with their cousins. They were making progress on Vamu's grand new dam design. Their family was growing and taking on more jobs, though the inventor huts were still empty, and they were stockpiling a lot of resources to enable their growth, so they were united and enthusiastic about the work they were doing. They weren't thinking about the Iron Teeth at all. Actually, most of these beavers didn't even remember their beef with their cousins. The feud didn't survive the starvation death wave, if you will. So imagine their surprise when they got word that their cousins wanted to meet. On the one hand, sure, a family reunion couldn't hurt, right? But on the other hand, this wasn't a great time to pause their work. They were on the cusp of exciting progress. Why now? But they didn't want to accidentally start a feud by saying no, so the folktales agreed to a meeting. The two families met at an old, familiar spot along the river. The entire Folktales family came to look impressive, but they were dwarfed by the huge Iron Teeth family. But they were both here, and it was time to talk it out. Azra went first and offered the Folktales a warm greeting. Same to you, came Vamu's reply. Now what do you want? We just wanted to know if you're cool, Azra explained. Our families used to fight a lot in the past. We wanted to know how you feel now. Our families used to fight? Well, yeah, all the time. Hmm, that doesn't sound right. Who are you again? We're your Iron Teeth cousins. How could you forget all the fighting that has happened between us? Oof, extended family, huh? Did we send you a card at Christmas? No, but you once blew up our leader on Thanksgiving. <gasps> you take that back. We don't even know you. Why would we try to blow you up? Because our families hate each other. We've been feuding for a long time. We came to destroy you recently, but called off the attack. You did what? Okay, clearly that upset you, but it's all water over the dam. 
Oh no! You just crossed the line! You've offended our folktale pride! And we're gonna make you pay! We might not have been feuding before, but we are now! And with that, the discussion was basically over, and both families left. After returning home and getting a good night's rest, it was time for the Iron Teeth to gather once more. The meeting with the Folktales had clarified things, and unfortunately for Razi, more beavers than ever now sided with Azra. A few staunch supporters stuck with Razi, but the future of the colony was now very clear. Even if the Folktales hadn't wanted a fight before, they did now, and it's not like the Iron Teeth could back down. The debate was officially over, and Azra had won, which left Razi and his supporters in a weird spot, but they weren't willing to compromise their beliefs. So Razi and all the beavers who wanted peace decided to leave the colony for good. They couldn't fight Azra anymore, but they wouldn't fight for him either. So after gathering some supplies and a quick round of goodbyes, this band of beavers left the home they loved, left the family they cared for, to start fresh somewhere else. was sad to see them go, but they had bigger things to worry about. The Folktales were gearing up for war, and the Iron Teeth needed to prepare. The Folktales were indeed gearing up. The Iron Teeth had threatened and belittled them. I mean, they had also spared them after the Death Wave, but that was completely beside the point. Who were the Iron Teeth to think they were better than the Folktales? Sure, they were a bigger family, but that didn't make them better, and the Folktales were going to prove it, starting with this dam. Yes, they were still focused on finishing the dam, but this would be their gateway to more power and all sorts of stuff. So really, it was an investment in their new feud with the Iron Teeth. They needed to prepare for this fight, but they were enthusiastic and moving quickly, and they had plenty of resources to do it. They were going to show those Iron Teeth just who they were dealing with. The settlement was a buzz. The beavers were all worked up. They almost couldn't sleep with this mix of anxiety and excitement, but when the morning came, their attention was abruptly shifted. They saw something in the air, out in the distance. The folktales weren't sure what it was, but it definitely wasn't there the day before, and it seemed to be heading their way. It had the beavers on high alert. Was this some sort of attack by the Iron Teeth? Perhaps a preemptive strike to stall their preparations? That would be just like the Iron Teeth, wouldn't it? Not that they actually knew what the Iron Teeth were like, but it was definitely getting closer. The beavers were on guard, just in case it was an Iron Teeth attack. They watched as it got closer and closer, until finally this little balloon-looking thing flew right over their settlement, right over their heads, and then touched down on a nearby island. The beavers rushed out to see what exactly it was that had landed in their backyard, and they were quite confused. It was definitely a balloon of sorts, but it had delivered some kind of package. Vamu directed them to bring it back home where she would inspect it, and later Vamu presented to the family what had been inside. The package had contained a letter written and sent out by another family of folktales. These folktales claimed to be part of a huge colony called the Collective, which had become a refuge for all folktales. And the balloon and letter were an invitation to any folktales out there to come and join this mega colony and be part of the Collective. But what was the family gonna do? Would they leave the settlement they had worked so hard to keep going? Abandon the dam and the new progress they were making? Give up this new feud they were about to start with the Iron Teeth? Well, of course they were. How could they pass up an invitation like this? So Vamu made the call and instructed the family, pack what you can, we leave in the morning. Talk about a new level of excitement in the family. This region had been a challenge for these beavers from the very beginning, and now they were finally going to leave it forever. Meanwhile, the Iron Teeth were preparing for war. They had spent several days debating, and now they had some catching up to do. They had a ton of crops to harvest, and they needed to take care of their, um, offspring. For better or for worse, the feud with the folktales was back on. The Iron Teeth colony was much bigger, but the debates may have set them back a little bit. They didn't want to be caught unprepared, so it was go time. Well, for most of the beavers. 
the family had shrunk a little, but right now they had to focus on the coming fight, make sure they were locked, stocked, and ready, and hopefully make the first move against the folktales. The beavers were a bit on edge, but they were iron teeth, and they wouldn't back down from a fight. Those folktales were going to get what was coming to them, that was for sure. Especially now that the family was united behind Azra's leadership, the iron teeth were a force to be reckoned with. They had gone back and forth and debated this for a long time. Nothing was going to stop them now, or so they thought. But in the morning, something new was in the air. Literally, it was in the air, something way out in the distance. Surely the folktales weren't already launching an attack, but it did seem to be coming right for them, and fast. The family braced themselves as this flying glider came closer into view, floating on the wind as if launched from a giant catapult. It flew right over them and their settlement, and then gently landed across the bridge. Of course, the beavers rushed out to see what it was that had just flown onto their land, expecting some kind of trap, but they were surprised to see a beaver sitting on the glider, an iron teeth beaver. So of course that changed everything, and they invited the pilot back to their settlement with them, and excitedly gathered around so they could hear him speak. The iron teeth had been preparing for war, but they were not prepared for what this beaver was about to say. He told them that far away was a giant colony of iron teeth, much bigger than their settlement, called the Great Society. And that's where he was from. He was a scout, and his job was to find other iron teeth colonies, like this one, and invite them to join the society, leaving their old settlements behind to be part of something bigger. The family was shocked, to say the least. But this beaver had shown up on a high-tech glider, so he must be legit. And it didn't take any debating this time. The whole family agreed to go with the scout and join the great society of iron teeth. They started packing for the journey and said goodbye to their home. It had been a good settlement, but there was no question they were headed for better things. As for the feud, that didn't seem very important anymore. They spent the evening reminiscing and sharing stories, and listening in wonder as the scout told them all about their soon-to-be new home. And when the morning came, the whole family set out for their new home and a new adventure. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is a wrap for Beaver Tales. Before I sign off, a couple of quick things. First, thank you for watching. Beaver Tales has been our most watched series ever, so thank you for your support. Second, we have beaver merch. If you follow the link in the description, you can get yourself a fun Beaver Tales inspired shirt or hoodie or sticker. And third, even though this show is over, I'm making cinematic gameplay adventures like this in other games all the time. So I hope you stick around and check out the fun things happening here at Lieutenant Dan Productions. You guys have a fantastic day. 